Good evening. Thank you for joining us from your homes tonight. We invite you to join us for the Easter series of which we're making preparation tonight. It is entitled, Making Your Joy Complete, which sounds a little crazy at a time like this. We've got people losing their jobs, loss of income, isolation, and this is a deadly virus. We have people dying around us, two in Manatee County, many others tested uh, uh, positive with this, uh, with this virus, and uh, certainly around the state and the nation and the world. Uh, and the, uh, the future's uncertain. So why would we have an Easter series called Making Your Joy Complete? Well, our theme passage is in the book of Philippians chapter 2. And in verse 2, we have these words by a guy named Paul. He's writing to a church, and he says to that church, Make my joy complete. Paul was in isolation. He was imprisoned. He lost his income as a tent maker and a preacher. He, his family and friends were fighting a deadly persecution and there was no end in sight. And yet he writes a letter about great joy. So we're going to combine that letter with the gospel accounts of uh, Jesus coming into Jerusalem, a little bit about what happened in that Passion Week, and then uh, on Friday, we'll, we'll celebrate Good Friday together, and then, of course, Resurrection Sunday. So we are going to join Paul in expecting God to make our joy complete, talk about how that happens. Uh, tonight, Let's go ahead and pray together, and then we will begin with a song of worship, and then we will uh, have a teaching, and we will conclude with a song of worship as well. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks for this great grace that we enjoy today. Thank you for the great privilege to be able to focus on you, to trust you. Thank you for the gospel that makes all the difference in life and in death. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to this planet, God and humanness, taking every sin we've ever committed, every act of rebellion, act of disobedience to the laws of God on your body on that cross. As you hung there, you bore the wrath of God in our place for every bad thing we've ever done. You were punished in our place. You died in our place. You have risen again. You are alive today. You've ascended into heaven 40 days after the crucifixion. You are alive, sovereign, on the throne today. And we worship you in all of our storms in all of our struggles, in all of our doubts, we trust you, we worship you, be honored in this time of faith and this time of obedience as we take in your word and sing your word. Thank you for grace today. In Jesus' name, amen.
would, grab your Bible and open up to the book of Philippians chapter 1. We, uh, last Wednesday, began in the book of Philippians, uh, introduced the book to you uh, by way of um, the book of Acts chapter 16. That's where Paul met some folks in Philippi. Uh, it's called Philippians because it's written to a bunch of believers there in Philippi that were left. And uh, Paul is now in prison. And he's writing to them about something that they experienced together, as we read last uh, Wednesday night in uh, the book of uh, Acts, chapter 16. That's the history of the early church, uh, where he was, he and his buddy uh, were arrested as missionaries. And they were uh, uh, locked up. And uh, after being beaten, and uh, they didn't know what the future held, but around midnight they were found worshiping, singing the scriptures, praying, and uh, how did they do that? What was going on? What was, you know, what, what makes people do things like that when totally, you, know, you just don't, don't know what the future holds, you're in tremendous pain, you've been beaten with rods. Um, you're just a mess, and there's a kind of a growing persecution uh, in the empire anyway. Uh, no relief in sight, and that was Paul's deal. Again, isolation. Now, he was released the next day from that scene, but now that we join him in this letter that he wrote back to the church in Philippi from being incarcerated in Rome, he was in isolation and had been in isolation, in other words, confinement by the authorities, for better than two years. He had lost his income as a tent maker and a preacher. He, his family and friends were facing a deadly mounting persecution. And there was total uncertainty in the future and no relief in sight, and yet he writes this letter about joy. I mean, it's just, it's like, it's crazy. And yet he wants to give us, by his example and by some teaching, how we can experience joy, even fullness or complete joy, no matter what our circumstances. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, today and Sunday, we're entitling Preparation for Making Your Joy Complete. And then on, um, on Sunday, we'll go over Palm Sunday and Preparation for Making Your Joy Complete. Then come Wednesday, Friday, and Resurrection Sunday, we hope to complete the uh, series, uh, spend some time in, Phil uh, in Philippians, but also spend most of our time in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, regarding the uh, life of an example of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. So, uh, Philippians chapter 1, let's go ahead and dig in. Uh, Philippians and chapter 1. By way of review, the first three verses, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers or pastors and deacons, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we mentioned last time, what a great intro. And so the first thing he locks in on regarding the joy of the Philippians, these folks in the city of, uh, of uh, Philippi in Greece, which were being persecuted, the first thing he locks in on is their identity. On the one hand, they, like Paul and Timothy, are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a great identity. We're here to serve others. On the other hand, they're saints, completely made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ, completely separated from the sin, separated to a life of ministry and purpose. In God's eyes, they're holy ones, saints. They are in Christ Jesus. That means they're inseparably united to Christ. Christ is in them. And they are in Christ united together. And that's true of every believer today. They are enveloped by grace because of the gospel, the good news. And therefore they have peace with God. 
And any bad thing that may be happening to them is not the punishing hand of God, because they know that they know that they know Jesus was punished in their place. And God somehow, some way, will use it for good now and eternally. So, if they're going to have joy, they need to know their identity in Christ, enveloped by grace, peace with God, in the eyes of God, they are saints, they are united to Jesus Christ. What happens to them happens to Jesus. That's the starting place. Number two, verse three, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, Paul. Here's teaching by way of uh, his own example. And he's thanking God for them. Every time he remembers them, he thanks God. And so, again, by way of review, we talked about using our church directories. If you're part of another church, we encourage you to grab their uh, phone book, their directory. And person by person by person, see what happens if you go through and each person, thank God for them. Remember them. And thank God for them. God works really good stuff in our hearts when we do that. Not only that, but now here's where we pick it up tonight. Number three, so if we're going to know joy, we got to know our identity in Christ. We have total peace with God. We're in grace. Number two, we need to practice thankfulness for one another that God has blessed us with, each other. And then number three, we come back to what we learn in uh, the book of Acts chapter 16, prayer and trust. And so for the uh, many verses upcoming, Paul says this, I'm always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. Now think about that. Prayer and joy go together. So as he's praying, he's filled with joy. Or we can say it this way, verse 3, as he remembers them, he's praying for them, and as he's praying for them, God fills him with joy. Now, before you poo-poo that example, really, I'm, I'm begging you to give that a shot. See what God does on the inside of each of us as we do that. So we're to pray for each other. And he goes on to say, next verse, verse 5, in view of your participation or your sharing. Now, some of you know this Greek word, koinonia. We have koinonia groups, sharing groups. And so they were sharing in the gospel. Paul was in the gospel. They were in the gospel. They were all sharing together in their relationship with God through the gospel. That's Jesus dying for them on that cross, offering the gift, the gift of forgiveness, eternal life, sainthood. And they were all there. So you're participating or sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. You've been hanging in there, trust in Christ. Therefore, he says in verse 6, the next verse, I'm confident of this thing. If you're, if you're trusting Christ, here's my confidence in God. I'm confident of this very thing that he, not you, but he who began a good work in you, if you're trusting Christ, he began it. And he will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming back again. If Jesus began a good work in you, and how do you know that? Because you're trusting Christ. God began that work. He will bring you all the way through. Paul's confident of that. And so he's got an eternal relationship with these believers, and he's praying for them and thanking God for them. Verse 7, notice what else goes with prayer and joy. It's only right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart. Paul's getting a little mushy here, and that's a good thing. Since, both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. That partakers of grace. It's the same Greek word, koinonia. That's a little preposition added on to it. It's the same word. You're sharers of grace. Back in verse 5, your sharers in the gospel, the gospel and God's grace go together. And so you're sharing in the grace of God. You're sharing in the gospel of God. You're sharing the work of Jesus Christ. Because of that, I view you as in Christ. You're my brothers and sisters. I have you in my heart. And that accompanies prayer as well. This emotion going beyond this kind of sterile love, this emotion of affection, this emotion of love. Where does that come from? 
Well, one of the ways that comes is from really, truly praying for each other daily and thanking God for each other. As we do that, God works this love, this affection in our hearts for each other. Says both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel, Paul is standing trial for the gospel, that's what's going on, you are partakers or sharers of grace with me. You're in the grace of God. I'm in the grace of God. You're in Christ. I'm in Christ. We're united to Him. We're united to each other. As we think about each other and pray for each other, we're in love with each other. Next verse. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ. Sometimes Paul is pegged as kind of this theologian dude who's kind of hardcore. And I guess he's pretty hardcore. But man, he had a soft heart. He had a heart of love, not just a, 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 a choosing to love enemies and a choosing to love brothers, but a warm affection. And we all want to experience that. How does it come? From prayer, from remembering. And God fills us with joy as we do that, and our love for each other grows, and we long for each other. We have each other in, in, in our hearts, and it's... The bottom line is, it's the affection of Christ. Verse 8 again. My God is my witness how I long for you all, listen, with the affection of Christ. So Christ working in Paul, placing his affection for those believers, that very affection in Paul's own heart. What a miracle. And God wants to do that. Christ wants to do that in our hearts as well for each other. But it doesn't happen magically. It happens as we're, according to this example, praying for each other. And so, let me make it really plain. Pull out your directory. Do three things with it. One, number one, with every single name, thank God slowly for every name. Number two, pray for each person. You say, what do I pray? Hang on to that thought. I'm going to get that in verse 9. But pray for each person. And then number three, obey God. And if God puts a person on your heart to give them a phone call, just say, hey, I was thinking about you. I was thanking God for you. I'm praying for you. Anything that you want me to pray about together. It's a little awkward, but as we do that with each other, we will grow in love and a longing in a affection for one another with the affection of Christ. All right? You say, well, again, back to the second point, you know, uh, what do we pray for each other? Verse 9, this is what I pray. Paul's teaching them by way of an example. That your love would abound more and more. He, he, a lot of stuff he could pray for. He could pray for their finances. I mean, they were losing jobs because of ostracism. And he could have prayed for their finances. He probably did. But the big thing he prayed for was that your love would abound and there was grow and overflow more and more. And we never arrive at this thing of loving each other, this thing of affection for each other. But it's not some just mushy, sentimental love. He says this in the next phrase, that your love may abound still more and more, listen, in real knowledge and all discernment. In other words, it's not a stupid love, just kind of mushy, want everybody to feel good no matter what. It's a smart love. It's a God-oriented love. It's a love informed from Scripture. And so as we have conviction of Scripture, we use that conviction to not flatter each other. That's from Satan. But to truly encourage each other in ways that are helpful to each other. And so as we get to know Scripture better and better, God's principles... We use that in our affirmation of building up one another. A great chapter on this would be, of course, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. We'll give that to you to, to, uh, to uh, pray through. All right? So use a smart love. Love folks, but use wisdom and discernment. And speak only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, that it might be give grace to the one who hears. That's Ephesians 4.29, I think. First thing, so that, so if you have a smart love, a discerning love, you will approve the things that are excellent, that will cause you to be sincere, or the word to be pure, you know, unalloyed is kind of the Greek word, pure, 
and blameless until the day of Christ. Jesus is coming again. We want to have a, a purity, a, a blamelessness in our walk. We, we never arrive, but we're growing in that way. You've already been filled with the fruit of righteousness that happened the, the day we got born again or regenerated. That comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. A lot of stuff there. Want to make it through the chapter because we've got to be on chapter 2 on Sunday morning. Uh, wrestle through that. Give us a call or even during this time if you have a question, or shoot us a question uh, via the um, uh, Facebook and we'll try to answer it uh, as best we can provided we have time. So that's the longest point, uh, our longest three points. Identity, thankfulness, and prayer with trust for one another. Number four, these are going to be a little bit quicker now, to have joy or to be prepared to have fullness of joy. This is only chapter one. He's got a whole book to write, but, you know, he's kind of preparing our hearts. Number four, Paul has a worker with us for our joy. Uh, number four, he uh, says this in verse 12. I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for, now, just let us fill in the blank on that one. We've got some bad stuff going on around us. And the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, isn't the only thing. That's got our attention. But there's many difficult things happening around us. With all of the bad circumstances around us, how did we complete the sentence as lived in the last, say, two weeks? I want you, if you're writing this letter to somebody, I want you to know, friend, my circumstances have turned out for what? How are we going in? Paul's incarcerated. He's not out sharing the gospel. He's not out, you know, preaching and all that kind of thing, witnessing on the street. He's incarcerated. He's actually wearing a chain right now. And he speaks about that. What's he going to say? I want you to know my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. And I can just feel it getting excited right now. So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. I mean, the, the guards in Rome that are guarding him and everybody else. Everybody knows why I'm here. And that most of the brethren, trusting the Lord because of my imprisonment, so somehow they got witness to have far more courage. These young believers have way more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Why? I'm, I'm speaking it. I'm, I might light my heads on the chopping block. Therefore, I'm encouraging or emboldening others to share the gospel. And that's what the body of, that's what the body of Christ does with each other. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ or sharing Jesus from like some really bad motives, envy and strife. I don't get that. That's, you know, there's bad preachers today and that's always going to be around. And some from goodwill. Let the latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel, the, you know, to witness for the uh, validity of the gospel. The former out of selfish ambition. Is Christ preached today out of selfish ambition? Yeah, unfortunately. Rather than pure motives. They're thinking that it caused me harm in my imprisonment or distress. Here's his response to that, though. You know, some people aren't preaching right. Some people aren't sharing right. Here's his response to that. Only that in every way. Now, again, he's, he's, he's like really just jacked up in this joy thing right now. And, and they feel this. As he's thinking about Christ being proclaimed by other people, some not even doing it right. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed. Check this out. And in this I rejoice, and I will rejoice. What got Paul excited? What filled him with joy? Yeah, this is the total filling with joy, but what really got him going? That Christ was being proclaimed by other people, shared by other people. That got him excited. If we're in love with Christ, that should get us excited. And I love it when people call me 
and they say, you know, somebody's uh, uh, out, uh, you know, with the kids singing, or somebody's out delivering food, or somebody's out doing this, that, or the other, helping somebody, and gets a chance to share a little bit about Jesus with an unbeliever, man, that just pumps me up. Like they're online, they're in one of these uh, uh, chat rooms, or all that kind of thing, and, and, and they're sharing Christ, and that just pumps. When I hear that, I'm like, yeah, let me, let me get out on the street. Uh, we're gonna be careful, but you know, it just—it just for believers, this gets us going. This fills us with joy. Verse 19. I know that this shall turn out for my deliverance through your prayers. In other words, prayer matters. You don't just say God's gonna deliver me, but I'm gonna be delivered through your prayers. Hmm, think about that. And the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So God's gonna do His work. But your prayers are part of my deliverance. According to my earnest expectation and hope, I shall not be put to shame in anything, but that with all courage or boldness, Christ shall even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And he gives you this bottom line. I think this is probably his motive at the time, I mean his, uh, his uh, motto at the time. This is a good motto for life. For verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To live is all about Christ. Point people with Christ, worshiping Christ, honoring him with other believers, point the lost people. Life is all about Christ. And if we die in the course, that's gain. That's an unbeatable attitude. And that's an attitude that can beat the coronavirus face to face and maintain joy. Even with a seriousness, maintain a joy. Well, the heart of a believer finds a way to witness. Check out a couple of these things. We need to continue to uh, help folks uh, shop. And um, take a moment with this. Um, this I printed out to this afternoon. Uh, part of the state executive order, uh, effective on April 3rd, two days from now, by Governor Ron DeSantis. We talked on Sunday, but... I'm during a sermon to mention that, uh, you know, uh, states' rights things, that we follow our state leaders, because there's all kinds of talking heads all over the place that are all over the spectrum on the national news. And uh, it's okay to listen to it, but we, we, we're going to be unified if we follow state directives. Directives from the state of Florida not being generated in New York. And so included in the executive order to catch us up, just so you can know, and, and with enthusiasm, approve and pray for our activities here. In section three of this executive order called essential activities, essential activities, we have these words. For purposes of this order and the conduct it limits, Essential activities means and encompasses the following. Number one, attending religious services conducted in churches, synagogues, and houses of worship. I am not asking you to, to open the doors and y'all come worship him. I'm not saying that. Just say it because you see some of us here. Uh, putting on this worship service, the, uh, the musicians and tech people, uh, we are not breaking state directives. It would be fine, according to this, if other people were here. Again, we're not opening this up for, for y'all to come. Okay, we want to go beyond what the state is requiring. But again, you heard the, the words, you can look this up online. And we can do uh, other recreational activities if we can social distance during those activities. We can take care of our pets and walk them. And the fourth thing is assisting a loved one or a friend. That's our ministry of helping people get their groceries if they're very, uh, if they're old and, uh, and or uh, uh, compromised in some way. Point is, from the state of Florida, as of today, what we're doing is right in line with, and quite frankly, beyond the requirements of the state of Florida, okay? So hopefully that'll put you at ease and help you pray and be excited about the ministry we continue to do. Of course, we'll keep you know, our ear to the state of Florida, and if they bring out another uh, uh, executive order uh, or, or guidelines, we'll, we'll certainly listen, but that's where we are right now. 
All right, so point number four is we get filled with joy when the gospel makes progress, and we're going to do everything we can to do so. So one way to do that is to hand out, uh, put on fences wherever you can, doorsteps, whatever, uh, the need help shopping cards. And folks can call us, and we will help them out. Uh, second of all, to call on your neighbors and ask them how they're doing. It might be awkward, but it helps grow a relationship. Maybe a chance to share your testimony, the gospel, pave the way in the course of time. Uh, certainly, invitations to watch these services or to join your life group, your Zoom life group, for people that are lost, invite them to join you. Who knows what will happen as they see Christians interact. Also, spend time with your extended family via Zoom or other uh, social networks. Some are joining chat rooms where people are struggling and gently getting the gospel through in these chat rooms. Letters and cards to missionaries, letters and cards to medical workers and first responders and the like. It's a great thing when your kids do that. Contact us. We'll get you set up to do that. Supporting missionaries continuing to give in a generous way as their uh, support is cut. We're talking about the gospel going forth, and we need to support our missionaries all the more right now as others are needing to cut their support. Prayer for missionaries and studying uh, their endeavors uh, so we get to uh, get a bigger and a stronger heart for what they're doing. Number five. Verse 22, next verse in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, next verse. Paul says this, what's the next thing that brings him joy, that will bring the Philippians joy, that will bring us joy? Verse 22, if I am to live on in the flesh, and that's not a bad statement for many of us to make right now, I don't think we should get cocky at this point, uh, there are reports of people of all ages dying of this thing. And so none of us has a place to get cocky. Not to mention auto accidents and many other ways that uh, take our lives. If I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fill in the blank. What is it for you? What is it for your family? What is it for your marriage? Paul's going to fill in the blank in just a moment. He's going to fill it in in a way that brings him great joy. What are you doing? What am I doing to bring ourselves great joy? Not that we focus on bringing ourselves joy, but he's just going, when I do this, great joy is a result. And so he fills in the blank with this. If I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Well, what is that fruitful labor? I'm going to bring our attention down a few verses to verse 25, and we'll back up again. The fruitful labor is this. I know I shall remain and continue with you all, listen now, for your progress and joy in the faith. I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm in prison. I'm writing this letter. I've done what I've, I've, done when I've been with you. I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm writing what I'm writing through this letter. My great goal is your progress, that means becoming more and more like Jesus, and your joy in the faith. Joy, worship, go together. Joy, rejoice, worship. He wanted this to be a joyous people. I can tell you the elders of this church and the leaders of this church want each of you to experience great joy, a depth of joy. No matter what else is happening. So now let's back up. Verse 22. Fruitful labor. And, and, and Paul goes, I don't know which to choose. And right now we might go, we could get the virus. Some of us, a few of us, might die from it. We don't know which to choose. We're hard. True, uh, true believers are hard pressed from both directions. We have a desire to depart and be with Christ, though so suicide's wrong. That's very much better. Best thing that can happen in this season is, for me, I get the virus and I die. That's very much better for me. Yet, Paul says to remain on in the flesh is better for your sake. So he's, he's in a quandary. He goes, 
I might appear before Caesar. He might put his thumb down. I'm a dead guy. That'd be the best day of my life. But if I'm to live on, it's better for you because I can help you with your progress and joy in the faith. Verse 25, next verse. Convinced of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Once again, I have the directory. Pulling out that directory, thanking God for each one, praying through, being obedient. As we're in that middle one, talking with them, praying with them, or the third one, rather, calling them, uh, you know, and praying with them. What needs to be on our minds is the progress, the growth, Christian growth, and the joy of the one we're speaking with. And that doesn't always happen with every phone call, but if we have that mindset, it's more apt to happen. When we do small groups, prayerfully praying for our hearts to be ready with the small group, it's good to think, you know, I'm joining the small group for the progress and joy of others. So for your progress and joy in the faith, in your trust in God. That's why we have small groups. That's why we have phones. Verse 26, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ through my coming to you again. And then the last point, number six, how does Paul experience joy? Through unity. Conduct your sin, how would how they experience joy? Through unity. This unity always brings grief. Unity brings joy. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now let me say, unity in Christ, unity in godliness brings joy. Where Christ is the focus. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Uh, the gospel is a free gift, but we need to live worthy of it once we trust Christ. So that whether I come to see you or remain absent, Paul is facing the death sentence. He seems to have the picture he's going to be released. I'm not sure if God kind of shared that with him. I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. It doesn't mean they have to be you know, totally uniform and everything wearing the same clothing. That's ridiculous. There's going to be differences, but there's going to be that, that one-mindedness that Christ is all and in all, and he and our life is about Christ. And we're, we're centered on his word. And we're going to have some differences, but we can still have a spirit of unity. And we can strive together. That's the reason, again, for those phone calls that we make with one another. No one goes through this alone. We've made that point, and we're going to make it again. Nobody. We're in unity. And so we keep calling each other, just praying together. And if you get bugged too much, just tell a person on the phone, uh, you're my 10th caller today, and, and uh, uh, we'll talk later. It, it be honest. Be honest. Last couple of verses. Verse 28. You know, I want to hear the folks being bugged in death. That would, that would just, ah, oh, would thrill me. And that would make my joy complete. Verse 28. Last couple of verses. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but a salvation for, for you, and that too from God. In other words, when people oppose you, then they can know they're opposing God, and they're in trouble. Uh, they can act what they want to act, but if they're opposing you, they're, they're in trouble with God. It's an evidence they need to repent and get right. For to you it has been granted. Now check this last uh, two verses out. For to you it has been granted. This is a gift from God. For Christ's sake, for his honor, for his glory. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake. Not only to believe in him, if you're believing in him, God granted you that gift to believe. But also to suffer. For his sake. Experience the same conflict which you saw in me and now appear to be in me. Newsflash, Christians suffer. A couple weeks ago, we talked about Christians suffering disease. Here, we're talking about Christians suffering persecution. Christians suffering, they're, they're not exempt. But as we do, we can experience a fullness of joy. And so we made it through chapter one, a little longer than I was anticipating. But that preps us for chapter 2, where the kind of the big uh, uh, deal is in regard to uh, uh, Palm Sunday and uh, the Passion Week and Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. So read at least the beginning of chapter 2 
prayerfully study it thoroughly. Verse 2 is our theme verse. Uh, do we have any? Uh, no, okay, nobody's called in, so we're in good shape. Uh, Van, if you would, go ahead and come on up. And we're going to worship the Lord with uh, a uh, song. Let's pray together before we do. Father, we give you thanks for this tremendous grace that we enjoy. What, what a privilege uh, to be able to be unified in you, Lord Jesus, to be able to speak with you in regard to one another and everything on our hearts, to know your presence, to know that we're enveloped by your grace, that we have peace with you, that we're in your eyes, we've been made saints by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we're united and in Christ. We live a life of, of fellowship, of prayer, speaking to you about one another. And to know that you work powerfully in our lives through that conversation with you. Thank you for technology, the privilege to talk to each other via the phone and Zoom and things like that. Thank you for this technology being used tonight. Guide us as we hopefully improve it greatly for Sunday. But uh, thank you for those working on it. Thank you so much for them. Father, we give you thanks for this uh, great privilege to know what Easter is all about. And that death on the cross for us in our place. Lord Jesus, you lived a perfect life. You purposely went to a cross, and there on that cross, you bore every act of rebellion any of us who trust you have ever done. You bore the wrath of God. You died in our place. You rose again, Resurrection Sunday, Easter, three days later. You ascended into heaven 40 days later after meeting with your disciples. You are our risen Savior, King. You are alive. We worship you. We focus on you. And we say together, for to each of us, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Thank you for the joy that you bring to our lives as we follow Paul's example, this example that you've led him in by the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Work a great joy in us. Prepare our hearts for Sunday. Thank you for grace, the gospel, and eternity. And we do again pray for our country and our witness for revival and healing and cleansing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's uh, focus on the Lord in song with one last song together. And I will uh, start this one with the right tempo this time. The band's very, very good at joining this old boy when he starts the song totally the wrong tempo. So uh, this will be the right tempo, and it's a great song about what we've been talking about. In the end of the storm
be it uh, tonight together or on a uh, later on in the week, Father. Uh, thank you for the privilege to be able to study your word together, to learn together, to minister together, to grow together, uh, most of all to worship uh, together. Pray that every marriage and every family would know fullness of worship. Thank you for grace. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for this Easter season and the privilege to minister to others. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless each one of you. God make you a blessing.